Well, good day, guys, and welcome to Life in the Peloton. I'm Mitch Docker, and the podcast is being brought to you by Rafa. In 2015, Rafa developed an international cycling club called the Rafa Cycling Club, the RCC. And today, it's got over 20,000 members. Rafa's clubhouses and stores are found all over the world from locations throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and of course, out here in Oceania. And one of those original members is David Murray. Let's hear what he has to say about what it's been like to be a member from the beginning right through to today. Being an original member, it actually felt pretty special. They put on a lot of private events for us in London. We were very lucky what went on. Things evolve, things change, you know, it became a big club, but it nothing really changed. Things change, but it doesn't change. I still feel like I'm a member of a bigger club, but people don't look down on me in the club or look up to me because I've been a member for so long. We meet people. Who cares about the number? You're a member of the RCC. Well, now today's podcast, it's the 26-year-old from Perth in Western Australia, Jai Hinley. He's ridden and raced bikes since he was six years old. He rode in Italy as an amateur and then eventually turned professional with Sunweb back in 2017. To date, he's already had a great career. He started off winning the Herald Sun Tour here in Australia. And in the same year, he finished second in the Giro, losing the pink on that last day to Teo Gagenhart in that final time trial. I know we all remember that because we were on the edge of our seat and wanted to see him take that victory home. But of course, most notably was last year when he won the Giro d'Italia. He came back taking the victory in glorious fashion and became Australia's first to do so and actually the only the second Australian to win a Grand Tour following Cadell Evans' victory in the Tour de France. We're going to chat about all that in the episode and more and about his ambitions on the coming Tour de France. This guy is a proper legend. Speaking about the Giro and the Tour de France and well, Grand Tours in general, one thing I love to take with me on the road when I was out racing was my Athletic Greens AG1 travel packs. It's difficult to get all the greens in while you're on a Grand Tour. It's all about refueling carbohydrates and the raw greens sometimes get pushed a little bit to the side. That's why I loved having my AG1 with me when I was racing a Grandy. It was just easy to have first thing in the morning or when I got back to the hotel after a stage to make sure I was still getting in all my good vitamins and minerals to top up that overall health. As a pro, it was about performance, the elite stuff. And even though I was using Athletic Greens when I was racing, I feel like now, when time is a little bit more precious, it really is still my go-to. It's an all-in-one pack full of vitamins and minerals. It's got superfood complexes, probiotics, plant extracts, antioxidants, enzyme and mushroom complexes. It's all there. It's just the perfect way to start the day for me. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, the Athletic Greens is giving you a one free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Now head across to Athletic Greens slash Life in the Peloton. That's Athletic Greens slash Life in the Peloton to get your first supply. Seriously, guys, get on to it. Now, I sat down with Jai way back at the Tour Down Under at the start of this year because I love doing podcasts in person and I did not want to do this one online. It was great. We got up in a little hotel room and had a good old chat. You will feel that vibe in this podcast. You may have heard me speak about it last week, just before we get to the episode, is the Life in the Peloton beer. It's happening. I can't believe it. I've got one. My very own beer. Bridge Road and I came together and we did it. Life in the Peloton and Bridge Road made the first ever beer. Guys, that's going to be released at the end of this week, so watch out for it. I hope you get your hands on some. I've had a little taste. It's delicious. I can guarantee that. Guys, without further ado, I'm going to let you enjoy this episode. Sit back. Here he is, Jai Hindley. Jai, g'day mate. G'day, g'day. How are you? Yeah, top notch mate. Couldn't be better. Back <laughs> in the land down under. <laughs> mate, we're going to go right through because I don't do them that often anymore because I feel like it's a bit stereotypical, but I need to know the full story of Jai Hinley um, and I know everyone out there wants to know it as well. We're going to go right back to the beginning. 
how did you get on a bike? Like, how did you become the man we know today? Take us right back to the start. Yeah, mate. I'll give you the the raw and the uncut. Version. Yeah, let's let's do it. Great, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we go back a long time. I started when I was six, right. and I was coming from a from a house where my yeah my dad was like very passionate about the history of cycling. You know, so when I was growing up, like Merckx was spoken of mm-hmm. like God in the house. Yeah, I mean. I didn't really appreciate that so much when I was younger, but then as I grew up and, uh, you know, got into cycling more and more, then I started to appreciate it more. But yeah, anyway, I'd, I started when I was six, quite young. We used to just go for, like, rides and stuff. and On a road bike or just, like, BMX? No, just, like, on a on a mountain bike, yeah. And I, I sort of, you know, I got into cycle, like, I got into bike riding like most kids and I had, like, hand-me-down bikes off my brother or cousins or whatever. And then, yeah, every weekend we used to just go for a ride or I used to ride with my dad to go get the newspaper at the Mm. servo or something like that. And then that just, you know, escalated and and then, yeah, before I knew it, I was, before I knew I was like going to the velodrome uh, at six, I would say. Is there a scene in in Perth, because you're from Perth, Western Mm. Australia, is there a scene for young kids on, on the velodrome? Because in Victoria, Brunswick Cycling Club, you know, Shout out to the best club in the world. They've got an amazing clinic for young kids. My kid's already at the clinic at five years old. Is that happening over there? Uh, when I was when I was starting out, there wasn't so much. I mean, that we there was like there was a few kids at the Midland Cycling Club. Like for example, Jess Allen was was there when I first came down. So we go way back. But on the road, there wasn't there wasn't so much. There were no races. There were no real training rides. So this sort of just like forced us to go to the track. Uh, me, my brother, we had a family friend that was also starting out and we just went down to, we got told to go down on a, on a Wednesday night, which was like the Midland Cycling Club night. Mm. And then, yeah, we just went down, met, uh, some of the kids that were there. There were, there wasn't like a huge crowd. I think there was like Cam and Trav when they were like teenagers and some other guys. Derbo hadn't, I don't think he'd started yet. And... Hadn't even started riding. Oh, Mate, I don't think Derbo was there when I first went there because I, I went there when I was like six. Do so you reckon you got a few, a couple of years up on Derbo? Yeah, sorry about that, Derbo. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> nah, I mean, I think he was. I think he was not long after, but yeah, him and uh, Freeberg and these guys, they were like maybe just a bit later. But I, I was like very young, yeah. And you guys went down there. You something you were asking your dad? Hey, let's go down the track. Were you pushing, or was it something more from your dad? It's like, no, you guys need to get down the track. Him and my mum, they were always like pushing for me and my brother to do sports, like, mm. and I think that was that was a good thing, you know, like be it cycling or t ball or football, like soccer or um, little athletics. I even played rugby one year, like. Did you? Yeah. yeah. What position? Fly half, mate. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I like yeah. it. So I mean, yeah, I just had to give that away because I was like too big for the other boys, you know. <laughs> Hurting too many kids. Because you were quite small when you were when you were a young fellow, from what I understand. So cycling, I wouldn't say cycling is, is great for that either, but it doesn't necessarily favour the oh, I guess it does at the young age if you if you you know grow really quickly. But you can also use tactics too and you learn to race better when you don't have that ability, don't you? Yeah, so I was like quite small for I mean I'm I wouldn't say I was like the tallest bloke now, but like Especially when I was a kid, I was like really small and I didn't grow till quite late, I would say. Mm. So for me, I was always sort of racing and riding against guys who were like double my size. So that sort of gave me like this, you know, I wasn't like on the back foot, but I always had to work like harder than, you know, the guys that had like mustaches at 15 and mm. uh, it just made me sort of rely on my, on like my skills more than my actual physical ability. And then, yeah, once the physical ability, like, came around, then, yeah, helped me a lot, I would say, yeah. Yeah, of course. Like, I think this is something really missing from the, the Peloton today is this this young age racing. And I'm not saying that every kid needs to start when they're six years old, but I, I do feel like there's a big gap now where a lot of guys are just going overseas and mm. never experienced that young age racing where you're learning all those skills when you're not strong enough that you're like, well, I'm just going to have to find a way to the front another way because I can't just ride around the outside. Have you thought about that in hindsight now and think, wow, that's actually a massive thing I've got, big skill that I've got that a lot of riders don't have. And once my ability caught up. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was that was like when I was a kid, it was like that. And then 
I mean, even when I was a teenager coming into my late teens, I was never like this super phenomenal athlete or something. Like I really had to rely on like other ways and, and like my skill set and other things to like, you know, be competitive. And mm. I think that actually like helped a lot. And um, yeah, then, you know, it was just like uh, years and years of, you know, graft and putting in the hard yards. And then, yeah, eventually it does like come good. And then you've also got this like mentality of like race craft and mm. and trying to be as efficient as possible and relying not just on your physical ability. Yeah, well, you learned that way. That's the way you're always going to race, yeah. regardless when your ability caught up. You didn't know any other way. Mm. Tell me about Midland Cycling Club. It's a pretty pinnacle club in Perth. Um, yeah, like you, you mentioned some great names there: Cameron Meyer, Travis Murray's brother, Luke Durbridge has come through there as well. There's many names I'm, I I don't know as well that you can tell me, but this is a pinnacle club for the talent coming out of WA. Tell me about your time there. Yeah, so I mean, also Michael Freeberg, Jess Allen, Rob Power, like heaps of guys, and yeah, I, don't, I mean, it was just like a great environment as like a young kid to go there. Like I said, they were they were like the sort of only club at the time when I was coming up that were promoting like uh, young guys and giving young guys like training sessions and this sort of stuff. Like, and I'm talking really young, like under ten years old. So that just like attracted us to that club and. I mean, I live like 40k away from Midland. Like we've always lived in the northern suburbs, like out of the city. And is there another club out there that you could have gone to? Uh, yeah, there was at the time. There was like northern districts, but yeah, I mean, like I, like I was saying, they just weren't a, at the time. They weren't a club that had like you know they weren't facilitating such young mm. kids. And Midland, they were they they didn't have a big setup or anything like that, but they were just taking. The passion was there. Yeah, yeah, they were just taking whoever and we were whoever, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, we went there. That just became like a regular thing. I mean, for a long time, all I could remember doing was like Wednesday night track session and then Saturday racing at the track, you know. And so we were going out there twice a week, which is also pretty solid, you know, doing the drive out mm. four times. And, yeah, it's like, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's that point where as a young guy, you you understand whether you want to do it or not because it's pretty easy to to to, mm. to pull away because it was a, it was an effort yeah i mean the thing is when i was at such a young age i would watch like the the tour and the highlights and it wasn't like it is now you know you would only get like a snippet mm. of the highlights and my old man used to always have it on and i remember watching that and thinking like shit yeah like that's what i want to do mm. from such a young age i would say like 6 or 7 years old i was thinking like that and, you know, like whenever at school when I graduated in year seven and everyone had to come up and give their speech and say, like, what they wanted to be, I said, like, yeah, I want to be a pro cyber. Wow. It was always like that. I didn't, I never wanted to do anything else. Yeah, I mean, I was also, like, super fortunate with my parents. They were, like, really supportive. If I had said to my parents, like, I want to be an astronaut, they would have said, like, we'll do everything we can to help that, to facilitate that. Were there the guys that you were sort of idolizing back then in the peloton? Who were those guys that you were looking at, you know, in the Tour de France or even the Aussie guys or? Yeah, for sure. Stu O'Grady and Rob McEwen. I mean, I was, yeah, it was around like that 2002 to 2003 like era. For me, like the two, mm. the 203 uh, tour is like. Oh, it's hands, a million Yeah, it's a, it's a goat tour, you know. Yeah. And I just remember watching like the, the sprint stages with like Cookie was also there, McEwen. O'Grady, they were there like rubbing shoulders, like headbutting each other and stuff. And I was just like, man, you know, these are guys from like the same country as me. It was just sick. Like, it was just so sick. The Centennial Tour, the, you know, you got, you've got Ulrich in the Bianchi kit. Yeah. The, the infamous time trial, yeah. he was maybe putting Lance, you know, if he hadn't have crashed, yeah. sparks. Yeah. And the whole top 10 was just stacked. Oh. You had like Tyler Hamilton, you yeah. had uh, Balocki, uh, Vinokurov. Like, it was just sick just yeah, was- watching that. And, I mean, I have like, well, still at my parents' house, we have like the highlights, <laughs> the highlights DVD, and I would actually watch that on like a portable DVD player, driving out to the track and driving out to racing, but like on repeat. I just, I lived for that, that highlights of 03 tour, like it was just the best. I 100% agree. Now, yeah, I've heard, I've done a bit of research about you, and I don't know exactly the story, but your dad, on your way to becoming pro, or your way to keep pursuing cycling, your dad actually made a cycling team. Mm. The GTR team, um, GDT, GDT, sorry, to go across to Belgium 
and race. I don't know exactly the story. I've only sort of heard this through the, the interwebs of um, different people. But tell me a little about this story and how all this came about. Yeah, so uh, cycling in, in Perth or in WA was like very, I don't know, it was just non-existent to have junior racing and for a long time there. And then over the years that developed more and then we had like crit races every now and then and some road races. But if you compared it to the scene over east, like we didn't have much. Mm. And my old man is from Manchester and he actually used to race like back in the day. and On the road? Yeah. And like rode for some Euro teams and like at a, at a continental level. So he had this like idea of what real racing was and what it was like you know in the real world of cycling in Europe and he was seeing what was going on in Perth and he you know he was hearing me saying like yeah I want to be a pro cyclist in Perth so yeah he's just like in his mind it's like okay he was also coaching some guys at the time he was like a Oz accredited coach and yeah we had like a few guys uh there was mainly like four originally and Rob Power was in this as well Mm. Um, yeah, he actually made a team. It was called like GDT, which was like Gordon's development team, or like some sweet. people used to say, like Gordon's dream team. <laughs> <laughs> and, it is, it yeah. is a dream team. Yeah. And, um, you know, like a lot of people were actually against it in Perth. Like they said, like, what are you doing with these kids? Like, why do you want to take them to Europe and this sort of stuff? And he, you know, he had to go against like a lot of people when a lot of people like didn't appreciate or like what he was doing, but he, you know, mm he knew what we wanted to do and he pushed full gas for that and yeah you know like a lot of the a lot of the guys there i mean the team grew and then we had like an actual i don't know how many guys were in in the end but we had more than four guys and quite a lot so it's quite small yeah Yeah. (laughs) but a lot of the guys like you know we weren't coming from super wealthy backgrounds or something so a lot of the time we would have to do like fundraisers to like finance the trip to europe Selling chocolates and things like selling this. Selling chocolates, Bunnings yeah. barbecues, doing uh, theatre fundraisers, like charity nights, like you name it, we did it. Hence why I love Bunnings snacks. Yeah, I was going to help get that later. So yeah, we were just car washes. We used to do like 100k rides in the hills. We used to park up at a, at a high school in the hills, do car washes and then ride home. Oh my God. So like just whatever we, we're just hustling man to get money to like fund these trips. You know, I'd never like, I just did it because it was like part of the dream, you know what I mean? And that paid for like the kits, that paid for like, you know, some flights, whatever we could get our hands on just to like get over to Europe and race. And we actually went in 2011 was the first time we went to uh, Belgium and Holland and we did some races there and that was like eye opening because I'd gone from racing with maybe like 20 guys tops in a Perth race to like 150 European guys in Belgium. And it was just like, Jesus Christ. It was like a different sport. Actually, yeah, it was that whole experience like helped so much, like going to Belgium, getting getting your teeth cut and like experiencing that real racing. And um, yeah, in the end, I like benefited from that like heaps because when I went back to, to Europe later on with the Aussie team, for example, you know, there were guys in that team that had never raced in Europe. Mm. And I'd gone there in 2011. So was it about your dad just giving you experience or he was like, I want people to see you? Or was it like, you know what, I don't really care what happens. You guys just need to feel, almost get your head kicked in. So when you come back to Perth or when you go back with the Aussie team, whatever, you've already had one or two years of foundation. Exactly, like that. He wanted to take us over there, get that exposure to the real racing. You know, obviously we got our heads kicked in like earlier and then... By the end, we were starting to like find our feet a bit, but mm. it was just a like eye-opening ex- experience, and I think something that just everyone has to do if they're from Oz and they want to mm. they want to make it, you know? Because yeah, I mean, racing in Oz is all right, but it's it's not real. It's not like the real world, you know? It's not, and then you you speaking exactly what I would love to sort of preach to young guys who's asked me, you know, how do you go across in GoPro? And you know, we started right at the start. Get yeah. racing as a junior. Yeah. And Next thing, get experience in Europe. It doesn't have to be already in a world tour team. It just needs to be at the ground level. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I could give any advice to like any punter who wants to like turn pro when they're young, just or even when they're old, man, just mm. get over to Europe, 
go to Belgium, even if even if you're not a you know big guy, even if you're a climber like like me. I went there, I got my ass handed to me, but I learned how to race and I learned like what bike racing is. Tell me, fast forward now, and let's talk about Italy mm. in your first experience in an Italian team going across there. Tell me what you know what happened there when you you flew across to Italy and you got that chance, and how did that all come about? Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, in 2014, I did like all the selection races to make the Aussie Junior Worlds team. And yeah, I had like an all right year. You know, Lucas was also selected, Lucas Hamilton, Michael Stora, and another guy, Queenslander James Thompson. We we all went to Worlds in Pond Friday, 2014. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I was second year under 19. Going into 2015, I had no team, like mm-hmm. no team. And, you know, I was sort of like hoping to just you know slot into the Aussie under 23 team but that was stacked and they already had like the roster full and they had the guys there that had been there for a couple of years so like no chance there you weren't on their radar uh, I don't think so no mm. and um so yeah I'm coming back to coming back to Oz I've got nothing sorted and uh we actually went to Italy to do some like training and racing before we met up with the Aussie team uh, for Junior Worlds. And I don't know how we swung it because I think it's like you have to be in an Italian team to race in Italy. Yeah. But we just rolled up to like three different races and raced in Italy. And when you say we, you mean... The, the guy, the GDT. Oh yeah, right. The GDT, yeah. right. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And like I've done racing in... I've been to Belgium a couple of times, but then when I went to Italy... I was just like, whoa, you know, this is, there was just like another level of game because right. it was like, you weren't just racing on the flat. It was like proper climbs. You got the Italian guys. They just like fast and furious. And that was, that was just awesome. And that was just like, yeah, I did that. And I just loved it straight away. And I wanted to be back racing in Italy where it like sued me. Yeah. So we, we, we made, we like met some contacts and like met some people at the races. Were you and- doing well? Uh, I was going all right, not like anything crazy, I would say. But you were finishing one in the in the in the bunch or in the in the front. Yeah, it's just or... like bunch or yeah. second bunch or whatever. Yeah, okay. Nothing, nothing crazy. Yeah, okay. Um, but like in Oz, I was going good. Yeah, okay. And that's like the difference, you know. Yes, yeah. let's just like Oz racing compared to Euro racing, it was just different. And we went to Worlds, and like all the boys got their heads kicked in. Yeah, okay. And I mean, Stora was. So I was on the podium in the TT. Don't, okay. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade there. <laughs> and um, yeah, so then we, I came back to Oz, had no team. I'm like, shit, man, I'm like, what are we going to do? I didn't even have an NRS team. Yeah, okay. Because at the time, like, there wasn't much coming from Perth NRS wise. The NRS at that time was like pretty decent, I would say. Mm. But I did, I had no contacts in the NRS. So yeah, we basically just hit up a guy that we met in Italy, started sending emails to him like can we find an under 23 team for July blah 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 and then we started to email like the Italian Cycling Federation just full gas just sending them like my Palmares you know which was like you know it was just like some local races and some races in Oz so like just nothing and did you mention the overseas races or you like don't mention that nah not really and yeah. like we're just hammering like send them this email out full gas like find me a team find me a team find me a team and then eventually they came back and they were like yep there's this team that We'll take it. Here's the contact. Did you even look into it? You're like, sweet. No. We've, got it. We've got a yes. Just straight onto it, mate. Yeah. Then uh, this was also quite late. By this point, it was maybe like end of Feb or oh, yeah. start of March. I'd actually then signed for a NRS team in Perth and did like tour to Perth and came over and did tour of Adelaide. Yeah, then we started getting in contact with this team. And then uh, basically like I was just conversing with them with Google Translate. I did, I, like I didn't speak any Italian. And... Um, you know, they were they were like, Okay, we'll pay for the flight over, you pay for the flight back. And for my parents at this point in my career was like massive because they just paid for everything up until this point. And to then have like a flight covered was like huge. Mm. So they were like, Yeah, we're still <laughs> gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Get on that flight. But we you know, I had no idea what, what I was walking into. This team was in uh it was based in Abruzzo, which is like yeah the middle of Italy and I had no idea where I was going to be living where I was you know who was picking me up from the airport if I was getting picked up from the did airport did you care or no nah. oh. it was just like get on that plane and like go <laughs> race <laughs> you know <laughs> and like looking back it's pretty hardcore but probably like the best experience of my life yeah, and right. so I've, I touched down I also had a nightmare travel time like the flight got delayed I had to stay in Doha like it was just messy and then I ended up landing in 
Pescara like two days later. I had to fly to Rome and then from Rome to Pescara, I got picked up at uh, Pescara Airport by two guys that I had no idea who they were. I went up to them and I said like, ciao, como esta? And they were like, uh, man, and then they said something else and I just blanked. And then they were like, shit, like this guy doesn't speak, this guy doesn't speak Italian. Did they have a sign with just Hinley on it? Nah, they just had like the team jumpers on okay. and I knew what the team was called. And then I was like, well, I guess I'm going with these guys. Yeah, I went back to the to the DS's house. He was this guy called Umberto, like iconic. And we just went back to his house super late, like it was one or two in the morning. He just like showed me a room. He was like, you're sleeping here? I went in to, Italian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to bed and then I got like a knock at the door like at, I don't know, 7 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> and he gives me this bag and I was like, oh, cool. Kit bag? Yeah, I opened the bag up full of like cycling kit. Cool. And I was like, oh, yeah, nice kit. And he's like, yeah. we're going racing. Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, we're going racing. It was like Saturday morning. Yeah. And like they usually do a one day race on Saturday and a one day race on Sunday. And I was like, yeah, mate, I just got off like a two day travel. Like I'm not racing. He's like, we're going racing. And then jumped in the car, drove into town, met the boys and luckily one of the guys spoke like really good english because like well, how were you even saying like i'm not going or how'd you racing well it was this all like yeah. hand signals no no like that can't. like this guy didn't even he couldn't even say the word english yeah, okay like no english and it was just like it was just epic mate okay and and then in the end i was there for six months well what did happen with the guy who could speak english did he help you out uh yeah he was like he was a really nice guy he was pretty quiet but he you know he like helped me out a, a lot but yeah, the thing was, he wasn't living with Umberto. It was just me and Umberto living together. So you can imagine it was just like, you know, this young Aussie guy and this 70 year old Italian dude, just like the 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 times, you know what I mean? Like just <laughs> doing life together. And it was like- yeah, Smoking was just, cigarellos and drinking grappa. It was wild, man. Like looking back, it was just like, you can't make that shit up. But mate, I mean, that whole experience ultimately like made me what I am and like, yeah, I mean, from that whole thing, like I just, you know, I learned so much on the bike. I learned so much off the bike, probably more so off the bike because when you live with someone like that, like, mate, you learn patience, you know, and when you can't communicate, like there were times when we were in the supermarket, just like screaming at each other, me in English, him in Italian, like full blown arguments about like tomato sauce, like ketchup. <laughs> And like, yeah, it's just like epic, man. Who, who cooked and stuff? So he he literally never cooked. He used to go out in the morning, like 10, 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. He'd go around just to like cafes, bars, restaurants, and he'd just like socialize. That was his life. And I used to just wake up, cook, go out training, come back, eat, sleep. And that, wow. was, that was like my life. And then I wouldn't see him until like the next morning, maybe. So we, we actually didn't see each other so much because he was just, he's just like out and about all the time. And I was just, you know, training and then coming back and then parking up on the bed. Did you feel like ever, I don't know, was it comfortable there? Or was it feeling sometimes like, I don't know if this is safe or whatever? It was always just like... No, I mean, yeah, it was just weird because like <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into at all. But, you know, in the end, this guy had like a heart of gold, man. Mm. Like... This guy was passionate. He's had the, at the time he'd had this team for like forty years. He'd had like a few Aussie guys. Actually, the guy who organises down under, Mike Turter, he raced for him. Shane Bannon also raced for him. So he had like a few international guys before. And mate, he just loved it. Like just you know, the team at that time was probably like second worst team in Italy. Mm. Like not good. Like we'd do we'd we go to a race and like after, after like two or three laps, half the boys would just be on the camp chairs like watching the race on the so, side of the road. So were you a pretty, like a good rider in that team for a long time or you took you a while to find your feet? I mean, I was like finishing races. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, like, was, that was a big thing. Yeah. So that was like the big thing, you know what I mean? And I mean, I had some results like here and there, some top tens, like I made a podium and that was epic. And Wow. But no, I didn't win any races, but yeah, just the whole experience was, was like next level. Did you learn anything off him about you know um from cycling you know like you know race craft or that sort of yeah stuff. or even just around the house and you know like things to eat or i'm not saying nutrition but like that old school cycling mentality you know like we race saturday sunday or was he ever passing anything not necessarily directly to you but from watching no nah, i mean not so much you know like oh. 
I wouldn't like he wasn't a former rider he just loved cycling and owned a team but I was like super fortunate because you get I've heard and seen like a lot of guys go to Italy and race and they you know they have like these real old school guys running the show and they don't you know give them food or tell them not to eat or that they need to be more skinny or blah 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 whereas my my DS he was like mate this guy used to just like shuffle food at me you know like in a good way wow like he would just tell me to eat and eat and eat yeah we used to always go to this one restaurant after the races it was like a pizzeria didn't matter what time we got there like he'd phone them up and say like stay open like we'd be driving back from Tuscany back to Abruzzo at like 12.45 at night and he'd say like we're on the way we're 45 minutes away stay open and these <laughs> these poor people would have to like get the fire started in the in the oven again and like you know they were just smashed and we'd roll up like full team there hungry boys like yeah we all want pieces and they'd bang out some pieces for us and like if i did well in a race he would make me get a pizza and he'd also order me like spaghetti ragu like a two-person portion and he'd make me eat it before everyone got their pizzas and then my pizza would come out oh my god and i'm just there like oh man <laughs> why was that like almost like a reward yeah yeah and and i would try share the the pasta with everyone and he'd just say like nah it's for jai why that they, they didn't yeah. call me jai they call me jay <laughs> for six months <laughs> <laughs> Still call me Jay. <laughs> was there any times, depressing times? You know, like you you're there on your own. And it does sound very fun now, but I, I'm I'm assuming we're we're coasting over a whole lot of other hard moments. Yeah, I mean for sure, there were like some real tough times. Like I mean, I just flew to this place that I'd never even heard of and spent six months of my life there and like didn't speak the language. So there were like massive hurdles. But mm. ultimately, like for me, I was living the dream. Mm. And like, like I said, like my parents would pay for everything. And like, when you get that opportunity where someone just pays for your flight and then pays for a roof over your head, like that was massive. Mm. And like, yeah, I mean, since I was six, I wanted to be a pro cyclist. And all of a sudden I'm living and racing and training in Italy, Mm. this country that I've like dreamed of racing in. So for me, it was like, was hard. Yeah. But ultimately, like I knew what I wanted to do. And that this was like a piece of the puzzle. Let's fast forward now to Sunweb. You know, it seems a million miles away from Italy. Mm. How did you f- end up finding yourself on a Dutch team? You know, ironically, well, maybe not ironically, but the team that I also started with, um, which was called Skill Shimano. And I was actually going to ask you a little bit about setting up um, because for me, it was my first setup. But for you, when we go back to, you know, coming to Belgium, then going to Italy, actually, it was just another little step in Europe. Tell me about that. You actually, you made it to the big leagues now. Um, how that came about and then what that set was like then working with a Dutch outfit. Yeah. So that was just like sweet. When I finally, you know, got that call or got that interest, it was actually after the 2017 Sun Tour, around second. And not long after that, I went back home and then uh graham brown actually sent me a message he was living in perth and someone had contacted him asking for my details and it was someone from sunweb and i was just like mate like Mm. you know what i mean that was that was just crazy that was like something that i'd worked for for like 20 years and then you finally get that call when it's like yeah it was happening it was sick and i still remember the phone call it was like super long they were you know they were super interested wanted to know everything about me and I told him everything man and (laughs) and like it was just awesome and yeah I mean also when a team contacts you like that early in the year that also said a lot to me like and they had this big long-term vision for me and what they thought I could do and what they had planned for me and yeah when you're when you're like a kid and and someone's like telling you all this it's huge and so yeah then i went back to europe i did like the 2017 season with the aussie team and had some results here and there and had you signed at that point or they were just saying look we, we're looking at you no i had i hadn't signed they just said like we're really interested okay and did it give you some kind of relief or you're sort of like ah oh, it's sort of bittersweet i know they're interested but that could also fall through no they were like to the point where they would have sent a contract like okay. then and there and so going into that season did you feel really relaxed you're like i'm there 
I would do is race out this season. No, I was still like super hungry. I've like always been hungry, man. And um, they, yeah, they said like, we're really interested and, you know, we, we really want you for the team and like, um, we're, we're here, you know, mm-hmm. like we're lining up sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I sort of said like, yeah, I mean, I also want to go back to Europe and race out the season and, um, yeah, I mean, and technically I was riding for like the, you know, the Michigan under 23 team. It wasn't officially that, but it was that. Mm. I mean, I hadn't even spoke to them. I hadn't had any like conversations with them at the time. Yeah, I was like, well, I should probably speak with them first. But I also want to like go back to Europe and mm. and have a crack at some of these big races. So mm. then that's what I did. And yeah, ultimately, like I ended up on, on Sunweb. I thought it was like... I, I thought at the time like it was a good opportunity for me. Maybe it was like I could have gone to Michigan as it was back then and um, yeah, slotted in with that Aussie outfit and it would have been comfy and it would have been sweet. Mm. But I don't. I I was looking at it like they had quite a lot of similar riders to me already. They had quite a lot of young climbers coming up. You know, I I, I wasn't at the level where I was going to go into the world tour and perform, but I was looking at it like that and like. You know, if I go there, where am I going to get a chance to ride for myself? And I was looking at Sunweb. They didn't have, like, such a stacked climbing roster. And I thought, like, yeah, I can go there. And when I also spoke to them, they said, like, yeah, we'll we'll send you to this race. We'll send you to that race as leader. And it was, like, sweet. I was actually telling someone this the other day. Like, I pretty much went in, into this team and said, like, yeah, what races can I be leader at? But I was nowhere near the level to be, like, leader at a race i went to tour of california as like leader or like go there and have a crack but mate i was the guys who were getting me bottles were like stronger than me (laughs) but they sent me there as leader anyway so it was like yeah i mean true to their word they gave me the opportunity and um mate i mean not a lot of teams would have done that and maybe if i mean i'm sure bike exchange whatever would have been a great team and i would have been happy there whatever and and all that but maybe i wouldn't have got the same mm. opportunities that i got at sunweb and for that like i don't regret anything and yeah i mean ultimately that gave me an opportunity to ride for gc at the duro in 2020 and maybe if i went to to Greenwich, that would have been an opportunity that wouldn't have come mm. so it's hard to say yeah Well, we're here in the historical town of Beechworth, the heart of Bridge Road Brewers, where it all started. We all have this idea of starting our own breweries, but Ben, you went and did it yourself. Mate, how did it all happen? You were way back in the beginning when craft was sort of, I thought, kicking off in Australia. Yeah, definitely. I, I did definitely didn't invent craft in Australia, but uh, started um, about making my own or starting my own co- commercial brewery back when I was 24 years old. Um, in my hometown of Beechworth. I opened the doors in 2005 uh, after growing up in Beechworth, as I said, yeah, doing a university degree in viticulture and winemaking at Tukey Agricultural College. Um, I headed off to Europe to work in, in the wine industry. Um, I'd done a lot of beer drinking in my time at Ag College, as you can imagine, <laughs> um, and backed that up in Europe with um, a lot of wine drinking and beer drinking, uh, Oktoberfest quite a few times, but really fell in love with beer while I was in Europe and kind of got disappointed when I came home to Australia and, and drank the beer on offer in country pubs um, that I'd grown up on wasn't what I thought it was. I decided I thought I could do something about it. So I lo- went away from wine and started looking at beer. I ended up doing a few winter seasons in, in Tyrol in Austria where, where I met my wife. Um, I was working uh, in a beer bar called Beer Himmel, which is beer, beer Heaven. It was a beers of the world bar, snowboarding in the day, working nights. And on my day off, I volunteered at a brewery in Innsbruck so I could learn how to brew. I did an online graduate diploma of brewing at the University of Ballarat and then returned home with 15 grand that I'd saved up from wine vintage and and snow work and uh, set about building a commercial brewery in my dad's garage. Wow, and then sort of the rest is history. I can't believe you're 15 years on and we're, you're still loving it? Yeah, 18, 18, 18 years. 18 years, sorry, yeah. 18 years. Um, yeah, I still love it. I try to keep a good balance. Um, you wanted to meet me at the brewery today, um, but I kind of, I've, I've been there all week and, and had a few beers there as well. So just trying to find the right balance. I get out on the bike all the time, as you know. Um, yeah, but I still still really enjoy it. Um, my role changes. I'm not 
brewing very often wrote the recipe for your beer, but otherwise it's really up to the head brewer on, on most of those brewing things. So if you don't like it, you can blame me, no one else. Well, you heard it here first. We've got the master who wrote the recipe, the life of the Peloton beer. Tell me about it, Ben. You've been away brewing back in the in the brew house. What have we got? Yeah, we, we, did, uh, we have talked about this beer for about a year, I think, Mitch. Um, and it took a long time to try and understand what we were going to make. We looked at, uh, you know, your love of Belgian beer and your love of beer, um, but also your love of Aussie pubs and probably classic Australian beers. So with that in mind, we've gone and created something that represents regional Australia. We're in a regional Australian town. Um, we've sourced our ingredients from small regional Australian producers, um, but we've thrown in a little bit of Belgium. We got some uh, yeast from a, a company in Melbourne that, that uses a yeast from Belgium called Bruges, is mm-hmm. the yeast strain. Um, so we've combined those Aussie ingredients with the Belgian yeast to make a, a life in the Peloton beer, mainly for you. Mate, beautiful. You know how much I love my beer. It's not just for me. It's for all the listeners out there who get sick of me talking about beer. They're finally going to get a taste of what I think is the best brewer in Australia, and it's going to be a life in the Peloton beer. All right, Jai, let's talk about Wahoo because I use the Wahoo Roam. It's big. I can see everything on the screen. I love that thing because it shows me what I need to see. I follow the route when I'm out on the climbs. The Wahoo Roam. Are you using the Roam? No, I actually use the Bolt. The Bolt? Uh, uh, for the raising. small one? Yeah, yeah. For raising, I mean, it's really good. It's uh, small and, you know, you can upload the maps real quick on the bus before the race yeah actually you can still see everything i just have the maps and the distance and for me that's spot on so i was actually using it in amstel yesterday which was pretty ideal for all these back farm roads and everything yeah all the corners left right up down for the 36 climbs you actually had the climbs mapped in all the other guys on the bus you guys run through the climbs have you you know have your boat your bolts there you know, actually upload the file. Is it actually a usable feature for the rest of the guys on the team as well? Yeah, I'd say like probably most of the team use like the the maps and um, yeah, it's really helpful, you know. Uh, also in a ground tour, for example, probably every day I use just the maps on the page with the distance. And I mean, I'm not looking at it like all the time, but it's really helpful actually if you're on a, you know, if you're going up a climb or on a descent, you look down real quick, see if there's a, sharp corner or something coming up it's yeah actually it's a good uh safety feature as well the best thing i love about the climb feature is i get to compare myself against you i get to see how fast you've gone up the climbs and i get to see you know what i'm about three minutes behind you i'm loving the climb feature on the roam and actually the bolt as well i don't use the bolt because i don't need to save weight anymore but i'm really enjoying using the wahoo head mount and i'm actually pleased to hear that the pros are still finding the features just as useful as me outside of the peloton yeah for sure man also with the with the phone and the app it's really easy like to change what you have on the page or to upload your rides or to upload a track or something onto it it's really simple yeah for me it works really well and actually i've been using it for a number of years now really like it man awesome all right well let's get back to the episode and hear a little bit more about the big fella jai hinley Let's fast forward to, well, rewind a bit from the Giro, but fast forward from signing the Sunweb to that first Grand Tour, the mm. Vuelta. And I don't know if you remember this, but I think it's quite a funny story. You and I meeting at the airport, um, it was down south. I can't remember exactly what airport it was, but I remember you get off the plane and we're just waiting for our bags. And we met along the way um, at a Green Edge training camp. And, you know, I, I was a little bit aware of you, but I didn't actually know how good you were or how good you were going to become. Mm. So I thought I'd part, part, pass some advice on to you. <laughs> hey, mate, yeah, oh, first, first grand tour. Oh, look, mate, there's an old dog here. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some advice, you know. Don't make the mistake I made in my first grand tour is focusing on, you know, finishing it from the start, um, you know, because it'll just get too hard or seem too far away, you know, just chip away, make some goals. Yeah. You know, it's so-and-so, I didn't think anything of it and, you know, took the advice on really humbly and, yeah, okay, thanks, mate. And... um yeah, this three or four days later, this is a ridiculously hard stage, maybe five days later. Really, really hard start, like impossibly hard. The bunch is everywhere. I finally get back to the Peloton and I'm just losing my mind. I'm like, who could possibly be up the front of the race now? Like, this is a ridiculous start. This probably like the best riders only are in this front breakaway. As the radio clicks over the riders, Jai Hinley's in the front. I'm thinking to myself, here's me trying to tell this guy 
how to ride a grand tour. And he's in the hardest break possible in his first grandy. Now, I don't know if you remember back then, but, you know, let's just think about um, that first grand tour and, you know, how, how it all went for you and that, that experience of that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, that was some good advice. Like, still, you know what I mean? It's still very relevant and, like, I use that for sure. Um, but, yeah, it was, was epic. Like, I remember getting the call up to do the Vuelta and my parents actually came over and watched. They sort of had, like, a camper and were following the race. And, um, man, I just loved it. Like, really. It was just, like, sick. It was just full racing. You know what the Vuelta's like. You got these mad breakaway days and... You know, maybe technically back then I wasn't so switched on, but I was just like getting stuck in and just loved it. And I actually felt like when we hit that uh, third week, I actually felt like I was coming into my own and could like, I don't know, be part of the race a bit more and be more of like a player. And yeah, that I've, that's just something that I've like felt, I don't know, naturally and like have always felt it. And you know, the team could say that, that like the third week was my best week and then they sort of just ran with that as well, yeah. Well, let's talk about 2020 Giro. Um, a really weird year, mm-hmm. COVID year, a real condensed calendar. Um, and in, to a degree, a lot of races were sort of overlooked. Um, but one race I think that caught a lot of attention was that Giro, especially between that fight between you and Teo. And, you know, you, you also had Will go there as well and, you know, Teo had um, Rowan. It's this sort of internal battle. Yeah. Run me through that final part and how you were feeling to being at the very pointy end very quickly in a Grand Tour. Um, the Giro, too, a really iconic race. Mm. Um, arguably the most beautiful you know, race of the year. Uh, um, I can argue against that. Um, <laughs> but um, run me through all that process, more specifically the end of the race um, and how it came right down to the wire and, you know, especially coming to that time trial as the leader and knowing that potentially it was going to be difficult to hang on to dealing with this pressure at such a high level so quickly yeah that was just a wild a wild experience and probably like a shock yeah a big shock for me as much as it was for like the rest of the cycling world and the team and everyone like i for sure no one expected that and if you'd said to me like at the start when we're in sicily there like you're going to be on the podium at the end of this three weeks i would have said like yeah. yeah, you know what I would have said, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, the thing is, like, I've always wanted to be a Grand Tour rider. And I, like, when I had this first conversation with Somewhere, I said, I want to be a Grand Tour rider. And they were like, yeah, yeah, sure, buddy, sweet. That's always something I pushed for. And the first, you know, two years of my career couldn't have been further away from that. But it's something that I just kept working at and didn't lose faith in and just kept the dream there, you know, and just kept hungry and stayed motivated and... Uh, yeah, so, you know, 2020 Giro rolls around. It's a real weird year. We had these, like, altitude camps in Austria. I was, like, uh, the second camp we did was pumping out the best numbers I've ever done and, like, just feeling real good and, like, doing hard efforts back to back, day after day, easy. And, like, the team saw this and they were like, yeah, like, we're going to we're gonna take you as, like, a sort of shadow leader, as, as a protected rider to the 2020 Giro. And I was like, what? You know, like I'd, up until this point, I'd only been a domestic and helped guys, like helped work out a few races. You know, I'd never ridden like top 10 on a hilltop finish, for example, in a World Tour race, which is something that actually you need to do if you want to be a GC rider. So they said that to me. I was just like, shit. And then we had this meeting with the team. Did you feel pressure? Yeah, there I felt like a bit like, not like that I had to get a result, but I just felt pressure like, okay, the team really actually believes in me and, I need to like step it up here and we had this meeting with the team with the Juro boys I'll never forget it and like yeah they said like okay we're going to the Juro we've got Wilco for the GC we've got Bling for like some of the the hardest sprint stages and Jai's also going for GC it was like a zoom call you know yeah and I just I just remember like the silence on the call and I was just like oh no (laughs) like jeez and um big support from the other yeah, riders i mean not like I, I know. you know what i mean i could i, I could it surprise totally, them yeah i could totally understand everyone like i hadn't you know i'd run like second into a pole in 2019 but up until that point i'd done nothing yeah. gc wise and then the team's like yeah guys going there as a gc amazing like, confidence from the team i yeah. love it yeah like and that they they do that man they mm. they have faith in the guys and they back them mm. which like credit to them and so yeah we go we go to sicily 
uh i actually had like quite a lot of stomach problems in the first few days and like had some problems breathing had like cramps so on etna had like a shocking day and actually i think that day more or less cost me the race in my opinion already like i lost quite a lot of time there but then after that it picked up and i could like yeah i was starting to ride good again felt really good like really good and could like finish with the front guys every every test and that for me was like whoa. massive confidence yeah, that boost. was like, whoa you know and then we had this day i think it was stage 14 we finished on this like piancavallo climb it was like a real tough long climb and yeah there to this day is probably like best numbers i've ever pushed wow and like can you can you tell us those numbers or you can't uh, <laughs> <laughs> how much <laughs> yeah, all right we go on I mean, like, if you want to know them, you'll know them, you know? Okay. But anyway, it was, like, best I felt, best numbers I pushed, and, like, we pretty much rode up the climb with Wilco and Toe in my wheel, and then Toe on the stage. But after that, I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, I was like, mate, like, I'm feeling super good. So you started believing? Yeah, I mean, I started believing, but at the same time, I was just in shock because mm. it's, like, something I've always wanted to, to do but something that I hadn't done really up until that point. Mm. And then I've just like ridden up this climb with, yeah, at, at the front of a, of a Juro stage and I was just like mind blown. And then we still had another week of racing left. Mm. And Were you nervous that it was going to run out, that feeling? Yeah. I was shit my pants at the yeah. wheels are going to fall off for sure. Yeah. But then I, yeah, like I said, in the first Volta I did, I knew like the third week. week that I come together. So... Yeah, I was like, oh, I mean, it could go either way, but I'm feeling bloody good, so let's yeah. just go with it. And and then, yeah, we had, like, these these hard stages. I think I was, like, fifth or something on GC going into that last week. And then, and then yeah, we had some epic days, and then we had that, like, Stelvio day where, like, Rowan just, you know, ripped yeah. everyone's legs off. And, yeah, and then I ended up winning the stage, and it was just, like, massive. That was, like, my first pro win. And it was just like... Clean stage yeah. of the Giro. Yeah, I mean, mate, like, still can't believe it, you know? Like, what about um, Umberto? Um, Umberto, yeah. Umberto, they, yeah. Were, they were just going off, you know? Yeah. They even got him on, like, a Rye interview. Like, they phoned him up and got him on Rye TV, and, oh, it was epic. Yeah, awesome. And, um, yeah, then, I mean, you know, there was, a lot of, there was a lot of things going on there, you know? There was, like, the whole thing with Wilco. There was the whole thing with Teo. You know, there was all this controversy and, like, you know, also guys just like, who's this guy out of nowhere? And, mate, I was yeah. just like, Jesus Christ. Like, yeah, I was just blown away by it all. And what were you thinking that night coming into the TT? Because if anyone doesn't know, you had finished on the Silvio. No, nah, I was... Uh, sorry. That was... Um, Silvio was, like, the third or fourth last right. stage. If we did, like, Sestria. Sestria. And right. then, yeah, then I went into the jersey by, like, less than a second yeah. that night yeah then it's like mate, I didn't have time to think like we would drive we had to do a transfer from Sestria back to uh, Milan and and then yeah I just got given like the pink skin suit I'm like Jesus you know like like no one could believe it like like I said if you told me that in in Sicily where we started like yeah you're gonna be rolling into Milan in pink I would have said like piss off mate and then yeah there I was and um could you enjoy the moment at all or was too much weight on trying to win the whole race? I mean, I just I just wasn't letting myself think about it. Yeah, okay. Like I was, I knew what was going on, but I was just like not there totally. Like I was was just like in third person or something. Mm. Um, but I knew if I like really just thought about it, then it was just going to be like too much, you know? Mm. So I just like tried to do the basics good and um, yeah, in the end I lost and it was just like, brutal like really brutal i mean a total surprise that i was there in the first place but but then to, being so close yeah being so close and then losing it losing the juro three week race by less than a minute was like savage did you believe when you were able to get yourself around that and did you believe that you know because you could potentially go i was so close that may never happen again and potentially could never happen again. And we've seen it so many times with many riders that got so close, they're all on the podium and it never happens. Mm. Was there ever that thought, 
you know, I'm sure there was. Wow, shit. I was so close. This is a pretty weird year, COVID year. We had the Giro in, you know, late in the year. Maybe it's the weather that suited me. All these sort of things going through. Or you're just like, you know what? I got that close now. I'm definitely going to get one of these one day. Yeah, I mean, it took me a long time to get over it. And then, you know, I also copped a lot of shit. I actually copped shit for, like, finishing second of a Grand Tour. Wow. Like, oh, who's this guy? Oh, like, shit year. Lucky run. Like, there we go. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I had a lot of support. And then at the same time, I had a lot of guys like, ah, oh, yeah, fluke, fluke round. Mm. And it was like, man, the numbers we were doing in that duo, like, ask anyone who was there, like, they'll tell you how hard it was. Do you know if Teo's cop shit for that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've seen, I mean, I don't like, you know, I don't go out looking for it, but if you want to see it, like, mm. you get tagged in a lot of shit on social media. Sure. But yeah, in the end, Taylor's got his name on that trophy. How many of these turkeys have their name on that trophy, you know? What about next year then? You know, 2021, um, you had a pretty troubled year at the Giro. Wasn't wasn't a great year at all. You had a lot of problems. Yeah. And then again, you know, the critics are going to probably come out and go, yeah, there we go. Told you. <laughs> Fluke. Yeah. That was like another thing. Um, yeah, finished that. And, you know, obviously my like self-expectation and ev- everything has just risen dramatically in Mm. such a short time and then you know i've gone into 21 the team they didn't say like yep you're going here to win you're going there to win you're going there to win they just you know they they were also really supportive and they didn't want to like put all this pressure on they were really good about it but it was more so like from me i just wanted to just get back into it and be at that level again and yeah at the end of the day that always like never always happens like that like no matter what you do if you do everything right maybe still doesn't work out like that in 2021 i just had this like disaster year i had like literally everything that could have gone wrong went wrong and it was just like an absolute shit storm and you throw covid in there you throw like not being able to get back home in there Mm. all these other things it was just like it was just a nightmare and but in in the back of my mind it was like okay all this shit's going on whatever but like in my mind i knew i could be like at that level and perform at that level like i had done in 2020 so like all this shit was going on but i was still like super hungry and yeah then you know i ended up signing for bora i think that was like a good change it was something that i needed just you know i'd been with sunweb for four years up until that point and then this new opportunity came around new team new everything and i thought like yeah fresh start hit the reset button and then we yeah then we went there and then you know it wasn't on anyone's radar again like if you look at the bookies before the start my mates actually some mates back home actually put like a bet on me like uh before the Giro in t- uh, last year yeah. did they yeah yeah made like some solid coin you know did they yeah yeah so it's like so you threw the 21 Giro to get your odds up I'm getting it now <laughs> yeah. I'm reading the story <laughs> they're nice <laughs> yeah so it's just like I don't know it, it was just a disaster year but then I just had this like fresh everything like new yeah. bike new teammates new coach everything new environment and then i just like i just kept that hunger and the motivation how were you able to shut the critics out and was there anyone or not the critics but also the internal pressure that you i'm sure you built on yourself and the expectation and it's something that a lot of riders have they get that first result because there is no expectation you just, just do as good as you can you know and you, and anything you get is a success yeah. now suddenly you had this level yeah plus you had all those added critics in there that we spoke about how were you able, was it the change in team, was it the, the support network around you? Do you have anyone pinnacle that's sort of been able to help you, guide you through that? For sure, like the people in my inner circle, you know, like mm. these are the people that, like when the shit hits the fan, are you still a fan? Mm. You know, like these people were like there the whole time. Like my mum, my dad, my girlfriend, mm. some close mates that were in Girona, like just kept the head on, kept me like together when... You know, I mean, I was like, I wasn't doing too bad. I knew what was happening and it was just mm. not working for me. But at the end of the day, you still need these people to like support you, you know? And like those people owe everything to. Yeah, I mean, they supported me, but at no point in like 2021 did I think like, nah, this, mm. you know? I'd always thought like, nah, I'm going to get back to that. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Let's talk about 2022, the Giro. I want you to tell me as a bit of a story about the race, but more specifically the moment when you went and Carapaz couldn't follow your wheel and I was there watching it on the edge of my seat, losing my mind as everyone else was because it was just, this for me takes me back to almost 2003 feeling. 
Tour de France. Like, this is when I became a real fan because you don't see those moments often anymore. Well, I don't feel like you do. I feel like it's so controlled and you feel the winner coming and it's all... But this moment, Bora took control of the race and you guys did things differently in that race and you took the bull by the horns, you know, all these sayings and cliches, whatever, but it's true. Early in the race, you guys attacked on the downhill and set things up and this pinnacle attack... I didn't see that coming. I didn't see you defeating this team that looked, you know, sort of unstoppable. Yeah. Take me through what happened that year um, and how the team sort of molded this happening and what was happening even with the DSs. I think those, those guys did an amazing job too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was really like a full team performance. Like, yeah, it sounds like very cliche, but, you know, Ultimately, there is one guy on the podium, but it really is like mm. a full team effort to get that guy on the step. And we had this like idea as a team, like even before like the season started, I think it was already December in Mallorca. We had this meeting with like all the guys that were going to be more or less in the Juro team. And like we had this clear cut plan of like these guys are going to be leaders, these guys are going to be there to support. Mm. We had like Bookman. Keldman and me as like the leaders and then the other guys to help us and so that was all clear it's nice it's nice in a team because maybe a lot of people don't know this that sometimes teams go right up to the wine you don't know if you're in you don't know yeah. if you're out you're sort of using all your form to get in the team yeah but it's, knowing that in the back of your mind okay I'm going to be good on day one exactly and I think you know I think for the tour that's always different I don't think you can really do that for a tour team but for the duo like yeah, a bit less pressure. You can be more precise and have more of an upfront plan about who's going. So they had like this big plan. We take three guys there for GC, let the road decide, and um, yeah, get there as best shape. It, like get there in as best shape as possible, basically, to like everyone. And that was all going good until like I think Bookman was super sick after Basque Country. I was meant to start Liège, couldn't because I had this fever. Wilco crashed out of Liège. Mm. So in one moment, like, we've just gone from having three GC guys at a race to, like, everyone a big question mark. Mm. And, like, the stress was <laughs> massive, you know? I remember driving to the airport, like, a shell of a human uh, from this hotel in Liège to fly out of Brussels. And, like, the DS was just, like, uh, he's actually bald, but he was pulling his hair out, you know? <laughs> and, like, it was just like, mate, like, you know, I was sat in the back, like, falling asleep, um, drifting off because I was just buckled. And this was, what, 10 days out from the start of the, of the Juro in Hungary. And it's like, man. So I went back home. I, you know, I just had, like, three days off the bike, chilled, and then got back into it, but very easy. And then... You weren't feeling extra stress? You're just like, I just got to do what I got to do. Uh, I mean... In that situation, it's just out of your control. Mm. And I was actually, I thought it was COVID, but in the end, like, it wasn't COVID. And I was super lucky. And and then also, like, I had maybe two days where I was manned down. And then the third day, I was, like, really almost back to myself again, but, like, really tired. And then it just picked up really quick after that. And then, yeah, luckily, Wilco also came around. Bookman also came around. So then we, we ended up going to Hungary with, like, three guys again, you know, just, like, pieced it together. Nice. So it was, like, it, you know, it just went from, like, extremely terrible to, like, all right, not too bad, you know, by the time we got to Hungary. Yeah, then we still had the same plan and everything like that. And, and the boys were, like, exceptional. Like, the guys in that team were, like, all in every day, mate, like, everything, thinking about everything. There were guys, like... You know, if I wanted tomato sauce, they'd reach over and get it for me instead of like me getting it. Wow. Just little things like this and not stuff that I said, not stuff that they like made a big song and dance for, but just stuff that I noticed and like that was happening all the time. Like, and they were just, they couldn't have done more. I pretty much didn't put my face in the wind apart from like the TTs for three weeks. What about, what about this, this, this descent attack? You know, like, yeah. Um, on stage 14 to yeah. stage 14 you know this is this is a Gaspar who was a writer in the peloton um, really well known writer yeah. he came up with this idea that let, let's just mix it up let's just hit it on the descent and get you guys in front of the race yeah so they they actually went and did recon like they took some guys to Milano Torino which was actually like a pretty flat addition but Wilco went and some other guys 
and they actually did recon of the stage afterwards. And yeah, Gasper saw, you know, he's a pretty crafty guy and he was looking at this stage just like licking his lips and he'd, he'd like cheat everyone up the whole race, you know, he's like, that's stage 14, watch it. <laughs> that's stage 14, boys, like, that's coming, that's us. That's got our name written all over it. He was like cheating everyone up. And the best part about like that whole team was just the, like everyone bought into the plan because everyone also helped make the plan. Like it wasn't like a DS at the at the bus, like, okay, boys, do this, do that, be here, be there. Mm. It was like, what do you guys think? What are your ideas? What should we do? And then everyone gave their input. We pieced it together and then we went with that plan. Mm. So it was like, yeah, it was just it was just a sweet environment. Yeah, you know, Gasper was pushing full gas to light it up on this day and isolate everyone. And, and in the end, that's what we did. I mean, we weren't actually meant to go on that descent, but like uh, Aliotti young Italian boy he was just like going down there like Valentino Rossi <laughs> and like that was third wheel we were like screaming at him to slow down I thought we were going to crash every corner <laughs> <laughs> and I'm third wheel and I'm looking back and the bunch is just like blown to pieces and we had a guy up the road uh we had uh what four guys in the yeah four guys in the group All right Kamna Bookman Wilco Oh, we had five guys in the group we were actually meant to go up the superga mm. but we went already before that and then we came through the the finish line with with two laps to go and there was like 10 10 guys there we had like four guys in the group it's like so, so it was like mental you know and then yeah the other thing is like we had these leaders but like when wilco's race was done after stage nine like he had a mechanical right at the bottom of blockhouse couldn't have timed it worse with this uh wheel and I won the stage, but like the good thing about Wilco is like, mate, I went back to the bus that night and he was like so happy for me. Mm. And that that like says everything of him, you know. He'd also prepared for the duo like I had. It, you know, it was all in, that was his big goal. And then it just went out the window in one moment. And then like we had the rest day and then the next day he was there. All in. All in for me. And like you don't get that with everyone, man. Like, you really don't get that with all GC guys. Like, some guys have big egos. But with him, he was just like, my race is done, whatever. I'm not going to cry and sulk about it. Mm. He just, like, he was all in on that moment. And that's, like, that's just special, you know. Well, tell me about the teamwork that happened in this final attack. Um, you guys were putting a guy up the road. It's a common move that we see. And Kemner comes back. You've attacked Carapaz. He's, he's waiting for you. Run me through what was going through your mind this this is it. This is the moment. Or you're just so deep in the zone, you know, doing it. Or you, you actually could, you were like, I've got to do this. Yeah, I mean, that was just like, the mentality before the stage was like, I've more or less secured the podium. And like... Anything more is a bonus. Yeah, I was like all in. You know oh. what I mean? It was like, I've, doesn't matter how I feel, how everything else is, this last climb, it's hard. It's, I've just got to go all in there. And like, you know, if I get, if I, if I blow and get dropped, whatever. But I'm like, still going to get third. I'm still going to probably be on the podium unless yeah. the wheels actually come off. Yeah. Okay. So that was like my mentality. Cool. And yeah, then, you know, that day I was like nervous, man. Like I don't get nervous so much for racing, maybe like the world championships with the Aussie boys and like, okay. uh, you know, mate, yeah, like maybe rolling into pink in the llama, like. I don't get nervous too much but I was pretty nervous before that day and like yeah then I saw like how the boys are riding like all in again like they had been and it was just that just motivates me like so much and Lenny was up the road super smart rider like really really intelligent rider yeah we, we hit this climb and like it had just been really the whole day was like really hard and I was like hurting and like mm. felt like shit basically my legs were like bricks and then, yeah, we hit this last climb. Sivakov was riding real solid tempo. I knew, like, Carapaz was going to go, like, after Sivakov pulled. And, yeah, just for me mentally as a climber, like, I know if I attack and then someone goes over the mm. top of me after I stop, that's, like, crazy hard mentally. Because yeah. it's like, you've just done an effort, this guy's just followed you, and then he's counted. Yeah. So I was like... Even though you know there's barely any slipstream... Yeah, there. even though I'm, like, running on fumes, I'm yeah. really tired as so I'm like, I've got to go over him as soon as he stops. What yeah. was that like at that moment? Were you on your limit? Yeah, completely, yeah. And then, yeah, this moment, like, Lenny's, like, he's being told to, like, be ready. 
and Carapaz is like attacked probably didn't see it on the footage but he's attacked and then I've like gone over him as soon as he stopped and like really just try to yeah just make full noise at that moment and then Lenny's like <laughs> I'll, I'll deal with the consequences yeah, later exactly right. and then Lenny's sort of like drifting back <laughs> and we're sort of just like coming to each other and I said nothing to him man I didn't not one like I couldn't I was just on the limit but I didn't need to say anything either like he just saw me coming he saw me get on the wheel he jammed at full gas I don't know how long maybe 30 seconds or something that's all I needed and then uh you know I just heard like Carapaz is dropping I like looked back saw like 10 meters there and that was just that was it that was like that's all you needed from that moment on it was like in third person at full adrenaline rush like goosebumps moment and just went like full stick to the line and probably probably to this day like the deepest I've ever got in a bike race like I mean like I genuinely like crossed the line and like thought I passed out or something mate it just you had the you had the jersey in your hand you secured it the thing that I love about you, and we're going to go right back to the beginning, is right back to your old man. Yeah. Mercs, the culture, understanding the history of the sport. It's something that I've learned about you just from watching from afar. You appreciate old bikes. You appreciate old kits. Something that I love too. It's not that common now, young guys coming through or younger guys coming through that really take the time to understand the history of the sport and the culture. Mm. Something amazing happened after you won that Giro. You went into the museum, the Giro Museum, and you donated your jersey. And I'll let you tell the story a bit better than me because I've only sort of read about it a little bit. Um, you're, you you don't get many of those jerseys, especially no. if you only get it on the last day. And you walked into the museum and donated your jersey. Tell me a little bit about this idea. And also, I love that you know you also, from what I understand, bought your own ticket for it. Did it went unannounced. <laughs> tell me about this. Yeah, so... So we got to backtrack a bit. Um, in 2014, when we went to Italy to race, we actually stayed near Lake Como. And on one of the days, we went up the Gazalo, we visited the museum. And yeah, I remember like, oh, have you been in the museum? I've never been, no. no. Mate, you got to go. And like, for anyone who's like a fan of cycling, you go into this thing and it's just like, it's like walking into heaven, man. Like there's just memorabilia, there's bikes, there's jerseys, like everything. And like, I remember going in there and just being blown away by everything as a teenager. And the thing that stood out the most for me was they had this like set up this wall with like the pink jerseys from like over a whole range of years. Mm. And like, you could see the evolution of the, of the jersey over the years and like the winners and everything. And I was, man, I was looking at that, like that is sick. Mm. Like they've got some cool stuff in there. They've got bloody Viviani's like Olympic medals in there you know mm. they've got like cool shit in there and I saw that set up and I was just like like genuinely blown away as a teenager so after the Giro I had this like trip planned with my missus and we we're gonna go like no matter what happened yeah yeah but I hadn't like taken into account that I might win it <laughs> <laughs> so it was like pretty stupid in hindsight <laughs> But I had this whole trip booked, right? And we were actually going to stay in Bellagio for a couple of nights, which is the town at the bottom of the climb. And yeah, after the hotel, we were going to leave. And I said to my missus, like, I'm going to take you to this museum because it's like just a special place, like really cool. You've got the church next to the museum, which is also really nice. And the stuff they have in there is just like, it's just like bike heaven, man. It's like biblical shit. And next to that you've got the museum big setup and um you know i didn't want to make too much like of a fuss or anything we rolled in there had my sonny's on to the last minute took them off and it was like quiet fortunately i said to the lady at the counter like two tickets and pay for some tickets we went in had a look around for like maybe 45 minutes and then i was just like looking at this you know this wall with the pink jerseys again like i had done years ago mm. and it was like man it was just so sick. And I said to my girlfriend, like, because I had a skin suit, had two jerseys. And I said, like, I've got a jersey in the car. You reckon it'd be pretty cool if I, like, gave them the ladies at reception a jersey and they can, like, hang it up, you know? Yeah. That'd be, like, pretty cool. And she was like, yeah, yeah that's a great idea. So, so then we left. I said, like, ciao to the ladies at reception. <laughs> we left. I went to the car, like, got a jersey out of the suitcase, came back in. <laughs> and um yeah they just had no idea they were like oh. did they believe it no i mean they they just had no like i 
I came in and and I said like I want to donate this jersey to the museum and they were yeah. like yeah like yeah that's what I mean yeah. like they were like what no they just had no guy? idea at all yeah, yeah. and then I mean. like unfolded it had like the boy thing and then they were just looking at it like and then like after you know I could just see the cogs turning and then like after five seconds they were just like oh they really yeah. they recognized straight away and then they just went like crazy and yeah it was just nuts man it was super cool and they they were like really excited and it was just like a real special moment and then you know i said like i'll give it like here's the jersey you can hang it up sort of thing and they were like no no no, like you sign it you hang it up we were, like and then yeah, they they, made a big yeah game. yeah and uh you know then before i know it i'm like facetiming the director of the museum he's driving in his car this <laughs> italian guy and i'm like yeah yeah you know <laughs> and he's like we're having this conversation and i'm like you know, he was just like over the moon. This guy, you just couldn't believe it. And um, yeah, it was it was a real quiet day. So there weren't there weren't like too many people in there. Mm. Um, I hung this jersey up. It was just like oh, it was mm. just a sick, like, love, like really yeah. like goosebumps moment again. And yeah, just like my jersey with like some of the other guys there. And I just because I'd seen the jerseys and a lot of them had like donated by this guy or donated by this guy and none of them were really like donated by writers from what mm. i could see so i just thought like that's a cool element yeah it's I a just, really cool element i just thought like if i could give this jersey like i came here and it gave me so much like as a teenager this museum and i just thought like shit yeah it'd be cool if i gave him a jersey right oh well look, look <laughs> lastly that's an awesome story i wanted to hear that from the horse's mouth yeah, yeah. lastly mate the tour de france this year um it's it on the cards, and if it is on the cards, mm. how are you going about that? And you know, because look, you're the second Australian, and I know you've heard this a lot of times, but you're the second Australian to win a Grand Tour. The only the other Australian is Cadell Evans, and he won the Tour de France. And the the next obvious question is, you know, it's the biggest, you know, it's the biggest race in the world. It, it is the biggest race in the world. Yeah. Um, for all different things you know for all us riders there's different reasons different races we like but in the world scheme it's the race so i guess the next question is the tour you know it's going to be the next thing for you it's on the cards how are you handling the expectation you know it seems like now um the expectation that is something that you've been able to go through after this second in the giro and it's been almost like perfect preparation and then overcoming that like we spoke about before a lot of guys fade away they get so close they never be able to handle expectation this you know now we expect you to win you know now we expect this from you now you've got the two other big boy um how's it feeling with this you know coming yeah i mean just surreal you know Mm. like to yeah to to be at like the highest level in the sport and to perform at that level is like something that i've dreamed of but ever since i was a boy it was like to race at the tour like just to pin a number on at the tour is like a dream come true for me so it's like to then go there as like a leader of the team you know mm. that's that's massive yeah i mean there's a lot of you know there's a lot of out, like outside things going on there there's a lot of like pressure off people and everything but ultimately like yeah i'm in control of my own life and you know i can can do everything i can up until that point but yeah when we come to the race it is what it is and it goes how it goes so mm. In my mind, it's like you're only in control of what what you can control, and that's like the lead up and the run in and everything. I mean, sometimes you're not even in control of that. Mm. Like, can go like either way, but I think it, for for me, it's just important to just like stay calm as possible, not overthink everything. And at the end of the day, it is just a bike race. You know, what I mean, it's a bloody big bike race, mm. but it's like it is just a bike race. So it's like life goes on, mm. but um yeah it, it is like it is like special man to to yeah hopefully get there and like race that for me is like just massive so if i could go there as well and and be competitive and like you know try go for a stage or you know the ultimate dream would be to be on the podium um for sure that's not something that you can just do that's like years and years of graft and hard work and and energy and time and everything and um, that's the goal anyway mate it'll be great like you said it'll be great to see you get to the start line let's do that first mm. and then whatever happens from there yeah Um, mate thank you for being on the pod because it's been just fun kicking back I didn't yeah. realise how much we were just talking about stuff and I was like got so much more to ask you but yeah mate it's been awesome nah no worries like thanks for having me I really just like love having a yarn no. eh
Well, I hope you enjoyed that one. What a legend he is. Just such a great guy. And I can see why the rest of the team loves sacrificing themselves for him because he really is just such a down-to-earth guy. I wish him all the best this year in the Tour de France. I'll be watching and I hope it can come off for him a great result there at the Tour this year. Like I said at the start of the episode, you can hear it in my voice. I'm so excited. The Life in the Peloton beer is coming at the end of this week. Bridge Road and Life in the Peloton have come together to make this iconic beer. The Australian Ale with a hint of Belgian in it. I love it. It's going to be awesome. I hope you get your hands on some. I'll be drinking it all. So make sure you order some so I don't drink it all myself. Big thanks goes out to, of course, Rafa, who are behind the podcast, Meg, and Will Jones, who is piecing these episodes together for us. Guys, and of course, you guys for listening. Guess what? I got Jai Hindley for Talking Luft. That will be with you in a couple weeks' time. So guys, until then, cheers. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.